Good morning, good morning. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. So glad to have you with us on this Monday morning. Although I have to tell you, I did something really dumb yesterday and I really enjoyed it while I was doing it, but it, it, it turned out to be kind of dumb. Tell the story. I want to hear. I had Turkish coffee <laughs> yesterday evening after dinner, and the Turkish coffee was so good. It was delicious, nice and smooth. I mean, Turkish coffee is strong, but it's so smooth that I can drink it black, and I really enjoy it. And I was just fitful, fitful, fitful in sleep last night. You were tossing and turning? I was. That sounds like a song to play. I tossing know. Tossing and turning. Is yeah. That, is that a song? I've heard that song. <laughs> So anyway, I highly recommend Turkish coffee. It was delicious. Um, but uh, holy moly, I'm a little sleepy this so morning. So now she needs some more Turkish coffee to I, get her up and going right? today. Right? Uh, that's totally what I need. That's totally what I need. So um, there was a guy, a shark bumps a man off a paddleboard and attacks him. And this is in Hawaii. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, and this kind of, I mean, I, it's, it's freaking me out because we were just in Hawaii. This, oh, this is the one that you, you sent me that was so close to uh, where we were staying, actually. Well, actually, so the, uh, are the other articles that I've read said it was on the Big Island, but this yeah. one sounds like it was on Oahu. Oh, okay. But So I'm not sure. So a 25-year-old was critically injured in what is believed to be the first shark attack Oh, it was near the Big Island, near Hawaii's Big Island in years. Authorities say the man was paddleboarding Saturday morning with his father near the Kukio private community when the shark bumped him off his board. Apparently, they'd heard a scream from the ocean, and a private rescue team took a four-man canoe out to find a male individual who'd been bumped off his paddleboard about 100, 150 yards offshore. Um, they recovered him from the ocean, and he had injuries to his right side extremities, so arms and legs i'm supposing the man told rescuers that the shark tore into him after making him lose his balance and fall off the board his father gave the same account of the incident the injured man was airlifted to north hawaii community hospital before be being taken to queen's medical center on oahu and so the oahu is what made me think of the oahu yeah. uh, uh, officials say he lost part of his leg and he had injuries to his right arm the beach at kukio and other nearby beaches were closed after the attack but reopened sunday after hawaiian authorities search for sharks in the air wow wow well you and i both came in this morning in a very hawaiian mood yeah we're both wearing shirts with you know hawaiian yes themed shirts yes because because we've only been back we, we've been back for a full week and yet our brain is still there <laughs> in hawaii it's our happy place it is <laughs> tonight we'll have my ties exactly <laughs> to celebrate Oh. So anyway, I mean, you know, the thing about it is, so my mom used to live in Hawaii, yeah. and I and I remember her saying, you know, you got to watch out for where the turtles are because where the turtles are, there'll be sharks, and um, uh, and so you know, and there's lots and lots of turtles out there. Yeah. Um. So it's just it's just a little scary, you know. It's their water. We just play in it. It's true. So true. So yikes. Anyway, you pick a story. Shark attack. Um. So so you want me to pick a story? Okay. He's so, really prepared. No, no, no. I just had to click on a button. <laughs> um, so this is actually the grossest story ever, and I don't even know where to begin, but this guy, apparently he has the worst ever case of gonorrhea. Ew. And Ew. it is an antibiotic-resistant form of gonorrhea. So they can't kill this thing, right? And they've tried a variety of different uh, solutions, and none of it's working. Um, so learning, and, and I'll just read this right. Learning you have gonorrhea is bad. Learning... Officials consider your case of gonorrhea the worst ever is something entirely is, is something else entirely um, The uh, press association reports that a man in the United in the United Kingdom was diagnosed earlier this year With what is believed to be the first strain of gonorrhea to be resistant to the main antibiotic treatment Public Health L England says the man contracted the super gonorrhea during a sexual encounter with a woman in Southeast Asia his symptoms appeared about a month later, according to CNN. Okay, stop right there. So he was a sex tourist in Thailand. Because mm -hmm. that's, I, I, that's why a lot of people go to Thailand. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. As is usual with gonorrhea, doctors attempted to treat it with antibiotics, um, azithromycin and uh, um, Unusually, 
uh, the antibiotics didn't work. This is the first time a case has displayed such a high level of resistance to both of these drugs, and in most other commonly used antibiotics, said Gwenda Hughes, the, uh, the, the physician. Um, the, uh, the World Health Organization and the European Centers for Disease Control agree that it's the first, that it's a global first. Uh, the man's antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea is a major concern for experts who fear that the STD is becoming untreatable. Uh, the bacteria that causes gonorrhea are particularly smart, said Teodora Wee at uh, the World Health Organization. Um, every time we use a new class of antibiotics to treat the infection, the bacteria evolve to resist them. So, but we're already starting to see, it may not be like this case, but we're already starting to see antibiotic resistant gonorrhea in the, in California. Yeah. You know, and so it, it's just harder to treat. Not, this is, sounds like it's impossible to treat. Yeah. This is, you know, it's so, harder to treat. And, and STDs in general are on the rise, yeah. especially among teenagers. And, they, and I think they think, well, I'm not going to get HIV, and that's all they're worried about. But there are, there's herpes and syphilis and gonorrhea and, yeah. you know, all kinds of other um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases that you just don't want. Yep. Um, health officials now are going back through this man's sexual history uh, in order to make sure that they keep the gonorrhea from spreading. So far, no other cases have appeared um, including in the man's regular female partner in the UK. So um, I got to wonder, this girl, as she's finding out about all this stuff, you know, are they still together? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of gross, Ooh, right? right? Yeah. And so yeah. this is some fast facts on gonorrhea. Um, uh, it can be passed from mother to baby during delivery, wow. which is really scary. So then you have to have a C-section. Uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia can be experienced um, simultaneously. If untreated, it, can, cre it, it can, can increase a person's risk of acquiring or transmitting HIV. Yikes. Yeah. Yikes. So... It's bad on a lot of levels, it people. It is bad on a lot of levels. Here's a thought. Here's a crazy thought. Why don't you keep it in your pants until you really know the person? Hey. I I'm just saying. There you go. You, you, you know, and I, and I, you know, Southeast. The guy went to Thailand to be a sex tourist. And now? He was probably with some 12-year-old prostitute and uh, who's, um, you know, and this is really the sad thing about it. Uh, and, and. In Rotary International, one of the things, our, our region just took a trip last year to mm -hmm. Thailand to build um, irrigation systems so that families don't have to send their children into Bangkok, yeah. Bangkok, because that's unfortunately the reality. If it, to feed their families, these people are having to send their children in to be prostitutes, into, into Bangkok to be prostitutes. Yeah. Um, and so this is, this is the harsh, harsh reality, you know. The West really needs to knock it off. Let's help Thailand develop their country instead of abusing their children. Yeah, I'm, I agree. I'm just saying. I agree. So, yeah. Oh, that's so scary. That's an <laughs> And I wonder about her. Oh, yuck. Yeah. So, um, from the gross to the gross, no deal. Trump saw, signals an end to DACA compromises. DACA compromises push GOP to pass strict immigration restrictions. And the Democrats, um, are, he says the Democrats have had time to come to the bargaining table. Time's up, according to Donald Trump. Well, he is the decider. Now, He's that was George W. Bush. Okay. He is the president. <laughs> So we'll talk about that when we get back from the break. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we'll be right back. What if I told you you'd never have to make a house payment again? What if you could pay off much needed home repairs and even create an income stream based on the value of your home? If you're 62 years old or older, you could be eligible for a reverse mortgage. Call Tim Harrison and find out if a reverse mortgage is right for you. Call Tim at 800-566-2475. That's 800-566-2475. Tim Harrison, branch manager, NMLS number 170960. Broadview Mortgage Corporation is licensed by the Department of Business Oversight under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, license number 170952. Registered with the Nationwide Mortgage Licensing System and registry number 813B544. Broadview Mortgage, equal housing lender. Remember, if you never want to make a house payment again, except for property taxes, maintenance, and insurance, that's 800-566-2475. That's 800-566-2475. 
Locals in Loma Linda and Redlands all know and love the Family Homestyle Cafe, the home of the world's largest pancakes and the delicious mouth-watering food cooked up daily by their well-trained chefs. Sizzling thick-cut bacon, ham, and hand-pressed sausage. They take pride in the best quality, great economical values, with better portions served up with the pride of local ownership and great service. Near the corner of Anderson and Redlands Boulevard in Loma Linda, if you haven't tried out Chef Mark's Delights, you haven't had some of the best food in the area. And now, Chef Mark is upgrading his cafe and offering space for on-site gatherings, luncheons, and parties. Add a DJ for a great holiday party or luncheon, and you've got a no-fuss event with all the bells and whistles. Call Mark today at 909-478-9996. That's 909-478-9996. Or stop by the Homestyle Cafe in Loma Linda at Anderson and Redlands Boulevard. This year's San Bernardino State of the County and Regional Business Forum will be held on March 13th at the Citizens Business Bank Arena in Ontario. The event is titled Driving the Future of Business. It will address how we are creating a strong business environment and you're invited to join more than a thousand business professionals and government leaders who will hear how the county is creating that environment, including the economic impact of local control of Ontario International Airport. It'll begin at 4.30 p.m. For tickets, go to sbcountyadvantage.org looking to be healthier, happier, and closer to their life goals this new year. Join my friends and me as we share how you can develop a positive, energetic, and prosperous lifestyle as you pursue your dreams and goals passionately. Tune in to the newest and most dynamic talk show on the air, The Matt Rock Show, every Monday at 8 p.m. KCAA, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM. Get all the facts, all you need to know on KCAA Radio. For once in my life, I have someone who needs me, someone I've needed so long. For once, unafraid. Well, life leads me Somehow I know I'll be strong For once I can touch What my heart used to dream of Long before I Welcome back. I'm Erin Breaker. And I'm Toad Breaker. And we are on the brink. The morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. And so we continue our conversation about uh, the president's new comments on uh, immigration and DACA. So um, there's been a crackdown in California, b- mostly because of the defiance from California lawmakers yep. um, against uh, immigration, the Immigration Enforcement Agency, so ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, um, and that they've been, they did a raid this past weekend or this past week, not weekend, but week um, in Central California. Now, what happens in Central California about this time of year and through the whole summer? Uh, I would say farming, a lot of farming that they go out and they have to pick the crops and plant the crops. Yeah, and do they're all harvesting stuff. our food. Yes. And so, Mr. President, stop it. Because we all want to eat, and we can't do that if the food is rotting in the fields. Yeah. You know, it it seems to me that one of the the hallmarks of the Trump immigration policy is is sort of very specific to the states and the the places he doesn't like, right? So whereas the Obama administration just sort of was generally going after all these people and, and rounding up a lot more, Trump is actually rounding up fewer but he's doing it in a much more sort of targeted way against the, the, the places he doesn't like, like you mentioned, California, right? Yes. And, and so that's very problematic because it smacks of a sort of a political uh, uh, vendetta as opposed to an actual policy decision that's based on some rational need. You mean it's petulant and petty? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting because he's I, I really think Trump got rolled on this whole immigration issue by the Democrats. Um, he didn't understand how, how politics works in Washington, and he thought he could do his normal sort of uh, crazy-making, you know, of I'm going to create this, this, this um, drama, right, create a, cr- a crisis. So he, he basically removed DACA and said, we're going to remove this thing, thinking that that would force them to come to the table. Um, and then once he got to the table, then he could be his normal slippery self, you know, promise them the world, and then at the last minute back out and get everything he wanted. Well, none of that's worked out, none of it at all. 
and they basically have been able to vilify him as the one who removed, who, but, who repealed DACA. Because here's the thing. I believe that they don't want it repealed. No, I agree. I mean, they don't want, they don't, they don't want the immigration issue fixed because it raises money for them. Yes. It, 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 this wedge issue allows them to, to it, both sides. Yes. And this is not just against the Dems. The, uh, this is against both sides. It allows them to raise money from their base and to fire up their base. Yes. And in the meantime, you have these families that are hanging in the middle. And and not only you have these families and individuals, you have our food supply. Um, now, now, the the... The migrant farm workers generally aren't DACA kids, but their families are. Yeah. And and here's the thing: our economy needs people to pick our food. Yes. We have to, because your average American is not going to work as hard as is required to harvest to bring our crops in. You know, there, there have been programs to try to get Americans to go out and do that work, and they won't. They won't because do it. it's it's hard. Yeah. It's backbreaking out in the sun all day long. It's hard. Yeah. No, uh, but again, you know, I, Trump and, and the Democrats are both definitely playing to their base here. But I think that, you know, Trump was looking, I think he honestly thought that he was going to get them to the table and get them to, you know, make some deal to pay for the wall and all this other stuff so that they could get DACA back. And it hasn't worked out. And so now, now he, he's being vilified. You know, again, and I think rightfully so. But this here's the thing: policy. Congress, uh, for all the griping about the president, yeah, and and various presidents. I mean, this has been, you know, it's been H W. It was the Congress during the Reagan administration, all all the way forward. George W. Bush, try, George, yeah, George W. Bush tried to put in a guest worker program, and it was that didn't that didn't go anywhere. Yeah, and um. Uh, but it's Congress who has failed to act for 30 years. Yes, and true. It's very true. So it's Congress that makes the laws, folks, not the president. And so it's Congress that has, that has failed to act. I am sick to death of this. And the poor people who were stuck in the middle like ping pong balls, I, I, my heart goes out to them. Yeah, you know? m- me too. And it, it's interesting, you know, you say it's, the, it's Congress that makes the laws. And, and, and you're absolutely correct. You know, uh, Obama got dinged because he basically, I think, really overstepped his executive authority with DACA, uh, even though the courts have sort of backed it up and said that what he did was legal. But do you blame him? I don't. Uh, here's, I mean, but but my point is, is he that did overstep. My point is, is that it creates this precedent, and when, and now you have Trump who is 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 dismantling it um, when it when it's actually at least part of the solution to this problem, and I think that. Um, you know, it's just, it's ugly. It's ugly and it's bad policy. And at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot of upset people. You know, and we're hearing these stories and, and I recognize that they're cherry picked, but I'm hearing these stories of like the veteran who gets sent home after being here for 30 years and the, you know, mm-hmm. the, and these are, these are stories are true. They really are happening. Yep. Um, and it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. Our whole immigration policy doesn't make sense. And you hear people who don't know squat about immigration who say, well, just get in line. Well, okay, what does that mean? What really, what does that mean? That means they go back to a country, for the DACA kids, they go back to a country for, that they've never known for a period of five to ten years while, they, while they're in line. Yes. You know, so imagine that. Imagine, imagine your parents brought you from, pick a country, Norway, and uh, you, they don't speak Norwegian in the home, or maybe they do, but you speak English. You always went to American schools. You, your friends are American. And frankly, you didn't know you were illegal until you went to get a driver's license. Yeah. Because that's what happens to a surprisingly high number of kids. Yeah. Yeah, no, true. And now, and now you're being sent, sent back to this country that you've never lived in. And, and sort of having to fend for yourself until you can get in line and get through the process. And, you know, the, the laws are so convoluted, and a lot of these folks end up getting scammed. This is the other thing that happens quite often, is you have these agencies that say, oh, we'll help you to get your, your papers, and they spend thousands of dollars yep. uh, to get nothing in the end. But part of that is because our laws are so convoluted. Yep. You know, um, 
and I'll give you, and I've used this example before, but to me, this is the most egregious. I had two friends, actually clients of mine, years ago. Uh, one was from Germany and the other one was from Switzerland. They were basically the same age within a couple of years of each other. Both of them had businesses in the United States. Both were single. Both had invested money in businesses in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They went home for, for August because Europeans take August off. And they came back and on the way back, one of them was allowed to stay for 10 years and the other one was allowed to stay for 18 months. Yes. And they were basically the same person. Yes. From two countries that were, uh, that were positive, good friends with the United States. And they were create, creating economic yes. opportunity and here in the United in States. United, they, had, they had their money that they were investing in businesses in the Los Angeles area. So they, were, they hired people. They, you know, they had mm -hmm. active businesses here in the United States. Yes. And one got 10 years, the other got 18 months. Yes. It's so arbitrary. It's basically who you're looking at when you come through. Yeah. Who makes that decision. And that's wrong. It shouldn't be that way. So, or on your last trip to the embassy. Yeah. It's just crazy. So, you know, I, I think we all need to press our congressmen. I don't care what party they're in. Don't let them say, well, it's so-and-so's fault. No. You are there. You're the person that you were that we elected to be there. You need to make this a priority. This has to be fixed. This has to be fixed. I agree. So You've won me over. <laughs> that wasn't very hard. No, well, because we've, we've been on the same side of this issue for a while. For me, as a public school teacher, and uh, for 23 years, I've seen so many kids come through my classroom, and, and I've said this over and over again, some of the best kids I've ever taught have been those first-generation immigrant kids, those, those kids that have grown up to become the DACA kids. And I stay in touch with my students, and many of them have gone on to go to college. They are hard workers. These are kids who, who think of themselves as American citizens. I watch them every day stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance to, to the United States flag in my classroom, you know? And, and, and then to watch what they, how they get vilified in the media and how these, these, their families get vilified. And, and they're some of the hardest working, best kids in our schools. Absolutely. And, and, and some of the, the worst kids, and I'm making a very big generalization here, are, pardon me for saying this, the punk American kids who really sort of take school for granted and have sort of this attitude of, you know, it doesn't matter. The immigrants are the ones who show up and act like school is really a big deal. Like this is something that we're here for and we're working hard to make sure we get, take advantage of this great opportunity. The American kids don't seem to care at all. And I spend a big part of my day just trying to motivate kids to do the very basic things that they, they should show up ready to do. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I hate to say it like that. No, it's true. You know? and, and, and our society has flipped on its ear in a lot of ways. And it used to be that parents were much more supportive of the educational process and of the teachers in the classroom. And, you know, unfortunately, and, and there are still a lot of good parents out there that are doing that. But there's a, a, a growing number of parents that their attitude seems to be very antagonistic towards the schools, that they blame the schools for everything. And, and they don't want to take much of a hard look in the mirror about how they're have created these entitled little lazy kids, you know, and it's tough. It's tough to have those conversations, but, you know, we really need to be able to talk about this stuff and, and try to flip that culture back the way it should be. You know, it's really, it's not only school, uh, and I agree with you 100%, the immigrants who come to the United States seem to understand the American dream better than many, it, Mary, many Americans born here. And even from, you know, countries, well, that they come here with nothing. So they come from Vietnam or Cambodia. They come from Nigeria. Nigerians have done remarkably well in the United States. Yeah. They're a highly educated group. They're a high-earning group. Nigerians have done re remarkably well. Yeah. Um, uh, not all African immigrants have, just like not all Asian immigrants have um, and Latin American immigrants have, but but the families that seem to value education and, and see their way to, look, this is what I can do here. I can do amazing things here. They're able to be successful. So how do we get American kids to, number one, have the motivation, number two, see, connect the dots, and, um, and number three, take responsibility for what is being given to them? You know, our kids were in the same local schools you know, uh, you know, quote unquote, underperforming schools um, that that, you know, unsuccessful kids were in. Yes. You know, our kids went to local schools just like everybody else does. And they are successful because they worked at it. Yes. And and I'm going to throw this in there because we were extremely engaged and involved parents. 
right? Yes. I, I, there's a there's a piece there that I think you have. It's not. It's you know. It's it takes a team to get your kid through the school system, and if all you're doing is just pushing them out the door and putting them on the bus and saying bye, and you're not actively talking to their teachers, you're not checking their homework, you're not you know, uh, uh, constantly on them about what's going on at school and making sure that they're getting their stuff done and they're not getting into the trouble and all that. If you're not doing that, you, you're you're letting your kid fall through the cracks. So I, I'm going to, I'll say this last thing before because we have to go to break, but um, if your kid comes home with a story, the first thing that should come out of your mouth is, okay, I'm going to call your teacher. Will he or she tell me the same thing? Watch your kid's face. <laughs> Because right. they will do whatever, they're kids. They're going to push the boundaries and they're going to make up the story that sounds best for them. And so you look at them and you say, okay, that's, that's really terrible, Tommy. You know, I'm going to call your teacher. Is he going to tell me the same thing? Uh-huh. I thought so. <laughs> right. So with that, it's time for a break. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA. We'll be right back. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, K292 FQ Riverside, and K293 CF Moreno Valley. NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Carter. China fires back, slapping new tariffs on U.S. goods worth up to $3 billion. More than 120 American products sold in China facing the new tariffs starting today. China's move of retaliation for President Trump's tariffs on Chinese aluminum and steel. Police in Northern California say it appears a crash that killed a Portland area family last week may have been intentional. Family friends not buying it. Jen and Sarah were the most loving two moms that we could have ever seen on this earth, caring for six beautiful adopted children. Search crews have recovered the bodies of parents Jennifer and Sarah Hart and three of their adopted children after their SUV went off a cliff last week. Police say the three other children could have been swept away by the ocean. And acclaimed TV writer Stephen Bochco is dead at the age of 74. He died over the weekend. Bochco's the man behind Hill Street Blues, NYPD Blue, and other award-winning shows. Lisa Carter, NBC News Radio. It's time for traffic on KCAA. I'm Erin Brinker in San Bernardino on the 210 eastbound before Na North State Street. A solo car is now along the right shoulder. There's some stop and go traffic from North Riverside Avenue in Temecula on the 15 southbound before the 79 Winchester Road. A motorcycle crash is on the right shoulder in Corona on the 91 eastbound at the 15. A wreck has been cleared from the off ramp in Corona on the uh, so a mattress is on the right shoulder on the 91 westbound before McKinley in the Cajon Pass on the 15 southbound before Cleghorn Road. A crash is now along the right shoulder. There's slow traffic backed up from the escape ramp. This has been your traffic report on KCAA. We are the stations that leave no listener behind. I'm Erin Brinker. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Rod Tanner. For the first Monday in April, we'll have patchy fog well into the day. Otherwise, cloudy skies will gradually clear with a high of 71. We'll have patchy fog overnight. Otherwise, it'll be mostly hot. get off 51 with winds to 20 miles an hour. We'll have patchy fog Tuesday morning with a sunny day. Our high should be 79 as winds gust to 20 miles an hour. It'll be clear Tuesday night with a low of 52. Wednesday should be sunny with a high of 81. I'm Rod Tanner, broadcasting live from the Tri-City Center with a 10 and 210 freeways. We have the trifecta of talk in Southern California. KCA. 102.3 FM Riverside, 106.5 FM Redlands, and the Legacy, 1050 AM Loma Linda, San Bernardino. Hey, this is Gary Garver. You know, I've been having trouble getting a good night's sleep lately. Maybe you have too. Well, if you have been, South Pacific Sleep Lab can help you out. South Pacific Sleep Lab provides a personal study to help you find out how to get a great night of sleep. I've been having sleeping issues during the night lately for a number of reasons. South Pacific Sleep Lab evaluated me with an overnight study of my sleep pattern. With their professional staff, they were able to provide me with a diagnosis of my sleep pattern. And ever since, I haven't had much of a problem getting a great night of sleep. South Pacific Sleep Lab has locations throughout Southern California, including one in Fontana, and they will provide transportation to any of their locations at no cost to you. South Pacific Sleep Lab can help you out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just give them a call at 844-SAD-5050 to schedule your appointment today. That's 844-SAD-5050. Hi, everybody. Ray Lucia here with some important information about debt, your debt. 
Whether you have a first or second mortgage, you're looking to buy or refi a home or rental property, or just need to consolidate your credit cards to lower your payments and save some serious interest, you need to do some loan financial planning with Steve Allidort, my mortgage man, at LoanFinancialPlanner.com. Now, Steve's not your garden variety mortgage broker. He actually spends time evaluating how you can use the current super competitive interest rates to pay off your mortgage early. Purchase a rental property, improve your cash flow, upgrade to your dream home, or even help your kids or grandkids get into a house. That's what loan financial planning is all about. Steve's been helping me and my listeners for over two decades, and I can tell you he is the best finance guy in the business. Go to LoanFinancialPlanner.com, that's LoanFinancialPlanner.com, or call Steve Allidort at 888-563-1070, that's 888-563-1070. We can't be everything to everyone, or can we? The station that leaves no listener behind, KCAA. Welcome back. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. And I have to have to remind everybody all the ways you can follow us on social media. I am Erin Hunt Brinker on Facebook and at Erin Songbird on Twitter, although I'm less active on Twitter. And Erin um, Brinker on Instagram. And you are Tobin Brinker on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. You got it. So, and you're better about Instagram, I think, than I am. Although you're new. I'm still new on Instagram, and I don't post as much as on Instagram as I just kind of like to check other people's stuff out. I like Instagram, though. I'm getting used to it. It's, it's, it's a fun platform. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I am not a pictures person. Yeah. I mean, I like pictures. Don't get me wrong. I just don't remember to take them, right? I'm more yeah. of a words person. So Facebook is a better platform for me. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, I need to, I need to, younger people are on, not on Facebook. They're it's on true. They're on Instagram. They're on Snapchat, which is a totally different animal. It is. It is. So I don't know if you saw this. I just sh shared with you a story that I had found over the weekend from the New York Times about uh, the disparities between uh, black boys and white boys. And it was an interesting article because it debunks a couple of the, the sort of common myths about what's going on out there. But it also shows that the, the, uh, the issue of racism is maybe much deeper than we think. Um, specifically, they looked at 10,000 uh, boys, white and black, that grew up in rich families, okay? And they used data straight from the Census Department. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, you have a white boy whose father was a doctor. Well, they're going to find an African-American boy whose father's a doctor. They grew up in the same census tract, the same earning levels, and, and they, they tracked them to see what happened over, uh, over their lifetime, to see where they ended up. And um, this uh, m amazing gap develops. Um, uh, 39% of the white boys who grew up in rich families grew up uh, and also became rich, but only 17% of the African-American boys uh, who grew up rich were still rich when they were adults. Um, and, and they broke it into sort of five categories. You have rich, upper middle class, middle class, lower middle class, and poor adults. And um, the number of African-American boys who grew up in rich families who ended up in that lower middle class and, and poor uh, category was significantly different. They're almost opposite. So you end up with like uh, 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 two thirds of the white kids that are still in that upper bands of the rich and upper middle class, and only about a third of the African Americans that are in in the rich uh, bands. And then the other two thirds are flipped. So what is really curious about this, and makes me think that it's not necessarily racism, is that's not true for black women. Yeah. Well, and this is it. it the women, they did the same study with women, and the women, white women and African-American women, are, are almost perfectly correlated. So they see almost identical results that African-American women are, are at the same level. And what they're talking about is 
this idea that that this the kind of racism is is actually much more focused on black men than it is on women and um and I just found this a very fascinating study, and they broke it down in so many different ways. They looked at uh, whether they came from two-parent households versus single-parent households um, and tried to come up with all kinds of different ways to explain what might be going on. And basically the only factor, the only factor that explains it is race. That's it. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I, I, so it's, a, it's specific towards black men, but yes. not towards black women. Yes. And um, it's just a fascinating study. It's, it's quite a long article, um, and they, they talk to a lot of different people. Um, and one of the, the things that, that captured me was one of the individuals that they spoke to was a, uh, a guy who grew up to become a, a lawyer and, and was living a pretty decent life, African-American guy, talking about how even though he still got this, he grew up in a wealthy family and he's still got this wealth and status as a lawyer himself, that he has to be very careful about how he dresses when he goes outside because just wearing a, a track suit could put him into a, a, a category where people would view him as a threat. You know, and I just thought, found that was kind of fascinating. So we're going to have to talk about this at a later time because okay. we, I am excited to uh, welcome to the show Dev Ajla. He is the CEO of Catalog, a recruiting and insight firm that has provided talent and high-level strategy to some of the world's most innovative companies, including BMW, Good Magazine, Change.org, and Planned Parenthood. He speaks regularly and blogs for outlets that include Inc. Magazine and Fast Company. His writing and work have been featured in dozens of media outlets, including The New York Times, Glamour Magazine, MSNBC, CBC, and The Globe and Mail. He has written a book, 50 Ways to Get a Job, and welcome to the show, Dev Ashla. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, so 50 ways, I think I have the song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover <laughs> Stuck in My Head. <laughs> Pretty catchy. So, so, so tell us about what prompted you to write the book. Well, uh, I, um, it came from a lot of research that we did. So I read every career book from the 70s forward, which is a lot of career books. And uh, we interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and realized that a lot of the information that we use to navigate our careers today has not changed at all. It's literally the same stuff repackaged, except our careers have. You know, our careers today are nonlinear, and we're moving in and out of different jobs and freelance gigs and side hustles and and the way that we search for work hasn't changed. And so there's been a real shift from what we found was that people are making learning-based career decisions instead of stability-based ones. So they're, that's why you see people jumping around so much is because we're like, well, have I learned enough here? Have I learned everything I can? Now what can I do next? And where do I want to go next? And it's the reality is because a lot of the industries are shifting and moving around and jobs aren't as stable as they used to be. So we're kind of being forced into that. So, so in yeah. essence, we're all independent contractors, even if we have a W-2. <laughs> well, hopefully not all independent contractors, but there is, it, is, it is that mindset that we all need to have for sure. So, you know, I think about how, how jobs are landed, and it's usually you know somebody who knows somebody or there's a other, some other direct relationship, and it's been that way for as long as I can remember. Um, is, my, is my anecdotal opinion uh, accurate? Yes. No, of course. And, like, that's, that's the, the – the, what's interesting is that so many people, when they go to job search, are going and they're signing on to online and they're going to a job board and they're just sending their resumes out. And they're never getting a response, you know. And after three weeks of doing that and trusting some random algorithm that also picks your favorite YouTube video to try to pick your next job, <laughs> it basically sets you up to be in the worst place possible <laughs> to, to find the work that you need, you know. And so the, the, the book itself is just like short exercises that give you that momentum and directionality to your search so that the search itself will actually feel like the job that you want. Like it feels more fun. It feels exciting. And it gives you some hope because it puts that agency right back into your hand. So how do you introduce yourself if you don't have that connection already? Yeah, I mean, so of course, I mean, I think that's one of the most stressful situations is when you are at a party and you're like, so what do you do? And you're between things and it's just like panic, you know? And one of the ways that I like uh, um, to introduction is to say like, I work at, I'm working at the intersection of X, Y, and Z. And it can be three totally different things. They don't have to be related at all. And what's interesting about introducing yourself that way is that you see what other people pick up on. 
you know, and they, they'll ask you, like, oh, well, how are those things related? Or they'll, they'll pick one of them, and you can, the conversation will turn there. It kind of opens the field when you're being introduced. You could also, uh, when you're being introduced, you know, you, to go between, like, uh, I'm learning, what are you, so what do you do right now? Well, I'm learning about blah, blah, blah. And it's just another way, all of a sudden, the conversation's going to turn from, like, what you're working on to what you want to learn and what, what's next. And uh, those, those kinds of conversations can kind of be more, more fruitful and less stressful than stumbling through. So, you know, one of the challenges, you may fa- come face to face in at that same party um, with somebody that you, you maybe, you maybe you met, but you didn't really connect with and that you, you know, so how do you develop when you've cast somebody aside, essentially, how do you develop that relationship? Yeah, no. So that, that idea of like being cast aside, because, you know, you're going to get people when you're emailing people and you're reaching out to people and sometimes somebody ignores you or doesn't respond. Uh, there's this little trick that really works to sort of get their attention back and and to give you something to do so you're not just waiting. And it is sending them one email, being like, hey, I just want to say it was great to meet you, and thanks for the recommendation for the book that you said, or the follow-up on anything they said. Thanks for mentioning about the aquarium down there. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check it out. So you kind of make a light promise in that first email. And say two weeks go by, they don't respond. And you can send them one more note being like, hey, just want to tell you, I actually did re- read the book or actually did go visit the aquarium or I actually checked out. And I just want to tell you, it's really great. Thank you so much. And that kind of second thing where you actually made a promise and then you followed through on the promise without even the hearing from them. You know, this is now two emails. You haven't even heard from them back. It's such a high chance that a person will respond because so few people actually follow through on the things that they say and the promises and people it feels good if it's, it's a nice email to get um it's a it's a wonderful way, way of sort of winning someone over that cast you aside it's a really human thing instead of i want something from you it's you gave something to me thank you yes and it's a, that that approach that place of coming from like gratefulness is how the job search should feel. You know, the job search, another one of the, the things that I think is uh, another tip in the book is do two times the amount of research, spend two, two times the amount of time that you're going to spend asking for the person. So if you're asking for 15 minutes of someone's time, spend 30 minutes before researching them, reading the things about them online. And it's not because it's like that's just what you should do. It's because actually in that research is the people you're going to discover and the companies that you're going to come across that will actually hire you. And you go into that meeting feeling grateful. You're like, listen, I haven't even met you, but like, let me tell you, I read about this thing, and I found out about this other company, and I just want to say thank you. And then you're approaching the meeting from a place of gratefulness, which changes the whole feeling. So you don't want to sound like a stalker, though. <laughs> no, you don't want to sound like a stalker. But then also, if you do your work, you know, and you read what people put out online, you're not a stalker. You're just informed. And no one's going to blame you for that. So... When you finally do get that dream job, um, should you, should you schedule a buffer in between jobs, and and how long should that be? Yeah, you know the idea of scheduling a buffer between jobs is important because otherwise we just recreate what we had before. You know we are pattern based creatures, and if you're stressed out and running from one thing to the next, then in your next job, if you don't schedule a buffer, what happens is you just create another stressful running around situation. So it's like create a vacation buffer be- between jobs or even right before you move into job search can sort of help you reset your daily rhythm and your daily routine. So you can kind of come to neutral and decide what is it do I want? How do I want to work? And what do I want my work to give me? And both those questions together will help you set up for that dream career. So when you say vacation, you mean like go somewhere? And it doesn't have to be an extravagant vacation, but, you know, get an Airbnb and go away for a few days, that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even if it's staying at home, you just got to do different, you got to get do different routines. You got you to have enough mental space, put the phone away, put the internet away, take the stresses off for four days, five days, and stay one day longer than you think, just to sort of reset those, those rhythms. So the job market right now has been heating up, and we only have about 30 seconds left. The yeah. job market has been heating up. Do you think it is, a, it is a buyer's market or a seller's market at this point? You know, I think, honestly, if you are looking for a job, there is so much good work to do to do it. There's, there's so many good questions to ask, and there's good companies to hire that are hiring right now that it really the power is all in your favor. And, you know, I mean, check, check out the exercises. There's literally so much good work to do in order to find that work. So tell people uh, how they can follow you on social media. Do you have a website, et cetera? 
Yeah, you can check out 50 ways to get a job.com. All the exercises are up there. And then the book is, is sort of the trusted guy that you need to, to kind of go along and, and do the work itself. So check out the book and check out the website and, and, uh, Good luck. Awesome. Well, Dev Ajla, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been enlightening. <laughs> Great. Thank you for having me. So it's uh, time for a break. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA. We'll be right back. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. <laughs> Knuckles. Cracking. You may not mind the sound, you may despise it, or you could study it. A couple years back, Vinnie Sujo was taking a biomechanics class at the French Polytechnic School outside Paris, and he was on the hunt for the perfect class project. Even though they suggested many projects, I couldn't find one which is both practical and that I could complete within the framework of this class. So in frustration, I was cracking my knuckles one day, and that's when I realized, huh, that's interesting. And so a project was born, the physics of knuckle cracking. It's actually a subject of intense scientific investigation. Back in 1971, scientists figured they knew how it worked. The cracking sound was caused by bubbles popping within the fluid surrounding the knuckles. Or so they thought, because in 2015, shots were fired in the form of MRI visualization of the knuckles post-cracking. In fact, the bubbles were still there. The whole process happens too fast for imaging technology to visualize in real time. You'd need to shoot at 1,200 frames per second, 10 times faster than the best X-ray and MRI machines on the market. And that's when we realized that our model could help people better understand the origin of this sound. So using mathematical models, Suja and his colleague Abdul Barakat found that just a partial collapse of the bubbles could cause cracking sounds of the same degree, which might explain why the 2015 researchers still saw bubbles after the crack. The details are in the journal Scientific Reports. Further modeling of bubble behavior, both pre- and post-pop, will be needed, they say, before they're confident that they've truly cracked the case. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. The Tri-City Shopping Center in Redlands is home to some of the best bargain shopping in the region. Cityware, Style for Less, and Dollar Tree to name just a few. Friendly shop owners and staff are waiting for you to stop in for the many specials and bargains they're excited to share. The Tri-City Shopping Center is located just off I-10 between Alabama and the Tennessee exits in Redlands. Make it your home for all your shopping needs and you'll know why the Tri-City Center is called the Mall with a Heart. Locals in Loma Linda and Redlands all know and love the Family Homestyle Cafe, the home of the world's largest pancakes and the delicious mouth-watering food cooked up daily by their well-trained chefs. Sizzling thick-cut bacon, ham, and hand-pressed sausage. They take pride in the best quality, great economical values, with better portions served up with the pride of local ownership and great service. Near the corner of Anderson and Redlands Boulevard in Loma Linda, if you haven't tried out Chef Mark's Delights, you haven't had some of the best food in the area. And now, Chef Mark is upgrading his cafe and offering space for on-site gatherings, luncheons, and parties. Add a DJ for a great holiday party or luncheon, and you've got a no-fuss event with all the bells and whistles. Call Mark today at 909-478-9996. That's 909-478-9996. Or stop by the Homestyle Cafe in Loma Linda at Anderson and Redlands Boulevard. KCAA, where every day is a great day. Welcome back. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. And we continue our conversation about that uh, New York Times uh, article. Uh, Tobin, you want to pick that back up? Yeah. So, uh, you know, this article from the LA Times was basically focusing on um, uh, 
the the gap between uh, white and and um, African American men, specifically looking at them in that upper band that were raised in wealthy households, to see what happened to them afterwards, and um, you know it, it it is meant to address this idea that sometimes gets put out there that it's really not racism that's affecting people. It it has more to do with class, right? And so if it was just class, then if you started off the same, went to the same schools. And you would think that they would end up with the same outcome. And they do for African-American females versus African-American uh, white, white females. They're but the same. It's the same. But for the boys, for the boys, it's different. And, um, and so, you know, the only thing that sort of really explains that is, is some form of racism. So you talked occurring. about, right before we, we, we had our guest, um, Dev Ajla, uh, you, talked, you started talking about the fact that one, young, one man in particular, who was an affluent, successful professional man, uh, had to be very careful about what, what outfits he wears, like, you know, about how he dresses, because he has to portray or convey his status um, all the time. So the, the idea of wearing jeans and a T-shirt or wearing a tracksuit or wearing, you know, a sweatshirt, hoodie, yeah. um, he, he can't wear those things because people will think that he is uh, a thug. Yes. If he's outside of his normal, you know, work life, family life, he has to be very careful, he said, about what he wears to make sure that it was clear what his status was, right? So he would always be wearing a collared shirt or a tie or something that's a little dressier, and he can't just go out, you know— unshaven with a t-shirt on or 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 whatever or a tracksuit because then people may look at him and think oh he's a gangster you know and 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 i thought that was fascinating you know to hear him say that um now this article it didn't just look at uh african-american and white it looked at other races as well and you know we have this general perception about how um, asians outperform everybody right well what they found was actually amongst asians when they broke it out by people that had been living here forever, right, like this, they've just been here multiple generations, versus newly immigrated Asians, that there was a difference between Asians as well. And that the ones that, that are outperforming everyone, or guess which ones? Uh, the newly immigrated? The newly immigrated ones. This goes back to our conversation as well. Yes. And that when you separate out in the Asian population, the ones that are relatively new immigrants versus the ones that have been here for generations, the ones who've been here for generations perform very similarly to the whites. And it's just the new It's immigrants. American culture that's terrible. <laughs> uh, something like that. So um, <clears throat> it was fascinating. And, and they, they looked at the new immigrant stuff for the other groups as well. Um, but the only group that had a real significant difference in that population was the Asians, where you saw a big difference in terms of, of performance. There were some small changes, and they have, a, they have dynamic charts here so you can see the change. But the, the difference in change between the other groups is minimal. Um, and, and so this, is, this was no small sample. Um, the, the, the sample size was, what, 20 million children between 1978 and 1983 that they followed. Yes. Um, and this, they used census data that included tax files. The researchers were able to link the adult fortunes of those children to their parents' incomes. Names and addresses were hidden from the researchers. So that was all blind data. So, so researchers from Stanford and Harvard worked with people from the Census Bureau to, to get all of this data and do all this. And it's fascinating. And then the final piece of this article is they looked at different regions of the country and tried to understand sort of what happens to people who grow up in different settings. So if you, if you grow up rich in this area or grow up poor in this area, and what are your outcomes? And, and what they found was that the Southeast was generally the worst for everyone, um, but more so for, uh, for African-American kids. But, but that was the sort of the poorest part of the country. And... Um, uh, and, and they found that, you know, people who lived in very specific areas, uh, very specific zip codes, um, whose parents worked in very specific industries, and, and you know the industries we're going to talk about, coal mining, um, and, and some of those, those kinds of industries which we've seen sort of dying out or going away. Yes. They've had the worst outcomes. So we are at the end of our show for today. This is very, very interesting, and we will continue to talk about this as analysis uh, mo it c continues to come out. So I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the Brink, the morning show on KCAA. Have a great day, everyone. Mm -hmm.